Hi, hello everyone. My name is Kisandra, like um, David mentioned, <laughs> and I'll be doing my senior lecture today on empathy and yeah. So first I'm gonna start talking about what exactly is empathy. Then I'm gonna go into how does empathy impact patient care, uh, and then talk about how we can improve empathy um, and communication with our patients, and what is the association between empathy and burnout. Before we get started, I just wanna tell a story. Um, about a Haitian woman who comes to the ED in the 1980s with a complaint of vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain. Sounds like a story you've heard before. Um, upon examination, she's found to have a perirectal abscess that is not visible to the eye but palpated on rectal exam. The abscess is drained and she's sent home with antibiotics with no clear understanding of the procedure that was done and what to look out for. She's left a little bit confused and traumatized by a procedure as simple as the IND um, and the healthcare system altogether. Um, the health system that she thought she would have been, that would have been different from the one that she had experienced back home. She later gets pregnant and refuses to return to Kings County for fear of being left a victim at the hands of the same provider she had experienced um, in the 1980s. So she ends up going to Woodhall Hospital where she has multiple episiotomies without anesthesia and told after her fifth pregnancy that she had to have a tubal ligation or else she would die from severe anemia with a hemoglobin of 10. After trauma after trauma, she refuses to enter the steps of a hospital for decades, except to bring her children for wellness visits. Fast forward decades later, the same Haitian woman develops the same pain she experienced in the 1980s. She tells her daughter, who's now PGY2 at the hospital that she most feared. Her daughter directs her to the ED when her pain was out of proportion to the exam, and she refused, and within a day, EMS was activated by family. When she's altered and brought into the ED for altered mental status and found to be in DK and in septic shock. She later spent two weeks in the ICU before being downgraded to the floor for two weeks and completed two weeks of rehab to return home for Christmas of 2020. Fast forward to June, well, we're gonna backtrack a little bit, but we're gonna talk about June of 2018 where her daughter meets a group of residents um, and incoming interns who are both excited and nervous about the journey they're about to embark on. And she ends up spending just about every single day in the month of July with a group of people she would later look to as her extended family. She later finds out that the, as the year goes by, that their love and support both in and out the hospital remains the same. Now, she enters the ED on a Monday morning and her attention immediately is pulled in different directions. With three different lines blinking, she hears Dr. Agnor, critical, line on, critical call on um, line 21, only to see that line 21 is the only one without a light. As a family member of a patient approaches her to ask her, why hasn't her mother been seen in over 30 minutes after being placed in a room? A PCA then approaches her with an EKG saying, this is the best I could get. Is it good? Can you sign? As she directs, as she directs the PCA to the attending, a patient looks at her directly in the eye and asks, nurse, can I get a blanket? While another one says, yes, nurse, and some ice water. At the center of all this chaotic environment is the patient. The same patient who waited three hours in the waiting room. The same patient who's now moved to the asthma room in the vertical chairs. The same patient who's agonizing in pain while also wondering why, every, why everyone's asking about her vaginal bleeding and why she's in the asthma room. Or maybe she's the patient who's rushed into the trauma room as a stroke code. And as the operator echoes over, overhead, stroke code to CCT, she's found to be hypothermic, hypotensive, hypoglycemic, and a sepsis code is activated. In this environment of controlled chaos that we've become accustomed to, how many of us have actually stopped to think about the patient who was just placed in two hallway? Up until the moment where we approach a patient to collect our history, how many of us have thought about the patient's situation, perspective, and feelings or fears? At the core of its meaning, empathy is understanding the patient, communicating with the patient, and acting on behalf of the patient. Compared to sympathy, Empathy uses a concept known as compassion detachment, which is when the provider maintains objectivity, imagining the patient medically, so they can enter a state of separateness and sharing. The Society of General Internal Medicine defines empathy as the act of correctly acknowledging the emotional state of another without experiencing the state of oneself. As opposed to sympathy, which involves actually feeling um, compassion, sorrow, sadness, or pity, Empathy is understanding. The difference, however, how slight 
is actually really important. Since sympathy can potentially impede a physician's ability to be impartial and judgment-free. However, with empathy, there's actually no negative effect from being too empathetic, at least on the part of the patient, of the physician. So now that we've talked a little bit about what it is, why does it matter? Empathy in EM matters for the same reason empathy matters in our daily lives. Practicing empathy helps us to better understand our patient and relate to them. This is crucial in the ED. We're one of the only specialties that has successfully built trust and communicate meaningfully to a frightened patient within a moment's instant. And our ability to achieve this can be the difference between life or death. And in the cases where patients actually survive, it can play a role whether or not they decide to seek help in the healthcare system in the future. Empathy plays a major role in our ability to navigate barriers when it comes to communicating with our patients and establishing emergency report. Studies have shown that the effects of empathetic communication can lead to improvement in adherence to treatment plans, decrease in patient anxiety and distress, better diagnosing clinical outcomes, and improvement in patient satisfaction. It also plays a role in overall, um, in overall how the patient perceives waiting time, information delivery, and expressive quality. Um, when they looked at a bunch of patients um, and how they um, described their interactions with physicians in the ED, a lot of patients, despite what the waiting time and how long it took for them to be seen, um, they would describe certain physicians as courteous, understanding, concerned, kind, and conscientious, despite the fact um, that they didn't really, the fact that they really didn't really um, get the perfect diagnosis that they, they thought they would have gotten, or they didn't experience everything they thought they would experience, the fact that the patients were able, the physicians were able to communicate with, with them in an empathetic fashion, they still felt like they had an overall um, well experience. When it comes to empathetic communication, it will lead the patient to feel more comfortable, tell the physician more, instead of withholding information um, that they can find um, to be ashamed about or embarrassed about, like things like drug use or history of, of um, their sexual partners. Um, looking at this model um, from J Jenny and in, uh, in all in 2012, physicians were able to collect more detailed information when they applied empathetic communication. They're also able to come up with more accurate diagnoses, um, better understand the patient's needs directly, um, and that would directly impact the therapy that they offer to patients, also enhance communication. And long-term, it would affect the outcomes as well. At the same time, when empathetic communication was used, patients felt that, like they were actually listened to. They felt valued as individuals. They felt understood and accepted. Um, and it also formed a bridge between the isolation that a lot of these patients felt when it came to their illness. And a lot of times patients felt like their feelings and thoughts were validated as normal and expected. And this led to both um, improvements in short term and intermediate outcomes as well. When looking at um, empathetic interventions in general, this particular study was a randomized trial where they added a brief addition of like an empathetic comment around the time of discharge. Um, so with the empathetic interventions, what the physicians would do, would do is they basically would, physicians would verbally acknowledge that the patient was concerned about their symptoms. That was one thing they would do. And the, on the other case, the patient would also, the fact that they had a different experience as well was also acknowledged um, by the physician. This verbalization demonstrates that and understand the patient's feelings and recognition of their view was also always often unique. Um, addition of brief empathetic statements like this in the ED discharge scenarios basically showed that there was actually statistically significant reduction in thoughts regarding litigation. So a lot of the time these patients would likely say that they wouldn't pursue litigation even if they didn't get the right diagnoses. Um, if the providers would um, add like an empathetic comment towards the end of their discharge. So what are some strategies for conveying empathy, specifically in the ED? An area where you're constantly running from room to room to see patients of different levels of acuity, while also trying to manage all these different tasks, regardless of your preferred style of communication. Empathy has to do with listening to understand and not to respond. So you have to remember to pause, clear your mind, so that you may not be seen when you're seeing a patient in one room, that you're not thinking about what's going on in the previous room. And just take the time to listen to understand the patient 
and not to respond. And don't underestimate the power of nonverbal communication cues, especially in the ED where a lack of enough time can be an actual barrier to empathetic communication. So it's important not to act rush by interrupting the patient or looking at your watch or walking backwards towards your door as you're wrapping up what you're trying to say. Something as simple as direct eye contact or head nodding, forward leaning or being close to the patient or open arm position can leave a positive impact on the patient. Whereas other cues can negatively impact the patient as well. Like looking down, it could be seen as if you're not really interested in what they have to say or having tight lips when you smile. Um, it may feel like you're trying to conceal your feelings or having tight fists or can seem like you, you have a lot of tension or crossing your arms or your feet as well could come across as you being close-minded. So when looking at the effect of sitting versus standing on perception of provided time at bedside, a lot of patients thought that the physician spent an adequate amount of time with them and addressed their questions when they sat down versus when they seemed hurried and abrupt when coming in and out of the room. And this was irregardless of the actual time that the provider actually spent with the patient. When it comes to verbal communication, you have to think about your introduction to the patient. You have to introduce yourself when you enter the room, not only to the patient, but everyone who's in the room. And also identify their relationship to the, to the, um, to the patient as well. You have to set expectations. So when you see a patient, I try to identify their feelings. You can say something as simple as, you look so uncomfortable, what can I do to help you before jumping into the history? You could talk to them about their diagnoses. And you may say something along the lines like, we may not be able to find the final answer during this visit, but it doesn't mean that something's not actually going on. And when it comes to their treatment, you can also say something along the lines of, we will treat your pain or whatever is going on today as best as we can. But it would be unlikely for us to say that your pain is gonna be absolutely zero by the time you leave. So when, in addition that you wanna talk about responding to emotions, when it comes to patients, you wanna have open-ended questions when you're talking to them. You want to ask them to tell you more about whatever it is that they're talking about. And you can also say like things like, I wish, like, you know, I wish that CT wasn't taking so long. To, to basically show them that you do understand that the wait is long. Um, and that if you had a year away, you probably would have, things would probably move along a little bit faster. And you can also use a technique of asking, telling, and asking, which is basically when you ask the patient um, about what they know about the illness or whatever is going on, then you talk to them a little bit more, and then you ask them more questions to make sure they understand and you're on the same page. In addition, there's like the nurse mnemonic, which you can also use, um, which helps you to sort of respond to the emotions of the patient. So one of the first things you can do is um, try to name the emotion. You can say something along the lines of some people may feel frustrated in this situation, you know, but at the end of the day, you want to avoid telling the listener how they feel. You can say some people, but you should, shouldn't say that you, I, I understand that you feel frustrated. Uh, understanding. You can summarize what you heard the patient say, said. You can say, I am hearing you say this and give them the opportunity to correct you if you misunderstood them. Also respecting you want to sort of match the same intensity that the patient has. Uh, you can talk to them and say like, I'm impressed with like, you know, with the care that, you know, when you're talking in regards to, a, let's say a family member that's there at bedside. I'm impressed with the care you have been giving your father during this long battle with cancer. So if they feel frustrated, you can talk to them about that and sort of identify like how they're feeling as well and respect it for what it is, even though it might not be how you feel or how you think you would feel in that situation. And then supporting. Letting them know how much, longer, how much longer you are in the ER is such a simple thing that you can do. And just let them know, I'll be here for the next three hours. I'll be here till 7 a.m., you know? Um, so if you have any questions at any point, even if you're admitted, you can ask me. And then exploring. You can ask very focused questions or express interest in something that the patient mentioned to deepen the empathetic connection. When it comes to the SPIKES protocol, it's very similar to ask, tell, ask. Um, this is you know, a good way, a good protocol to use when discussing bad news with patients. Um, and it's just like sort of important to sort of set up the patient and understand like where they're coming from, like how much they know. Um, look at their perception. Uh, at the same time, look at how much knowledge they have about the situation. And, um, and from there, you can basically 
connect a lot of things together and deliver the best form of empathetic care that you can. When it comes to empathy and burnout, empathy has been shown to decline significantly during the end of medical school and the beginning of residency. Uh, empathy has been shown to decrease with things like fatigue, increase in fatigue, chronic sleep deprivation, high levels of anxiety, depression, and even burnout. This is especially concerning in emergency medicine where the burnout rate is particularly high. But interestingly enough, high levels of empathy may actually be protective against burnout. So recognizing and dealing with burnout is of the utmost importance for both, not only for ourselves, but for our patients that we see every day. When looking at the association between empathy and burnout among emergency um, medicine physicians, it has been seen that there's actually a, a, a negative correlation between emergency physician empathy and patient-related burnout. So as I mentioned before, as empathy increases, burnout decreases. When it comes to the association between emergency physicians um, and their self-reported empathy and patient satisfaction, um, this particular study looked at um, basically showed that evidence, there was actually evidence in a positive association between ED providers, um, self-reported empathy and aftercare instant um, when, patient, when it connects to patient and provider satisfaction. So there's overall like higher empathy scores were associated when a patient was actually satisfied um, despite many different characteristics that they encountered during their um, visit. Um, in this study where they looked at the patient, uh, the patients, uh, patients made certain suggestions on how to improve emergency physician empathy and communication. Some of the things that were mentioned is that patients mentioned that how providers could have verbalized back to them, like, so what are you saying this happened and how did you feel about it? Um, they also talked about they would have preferred more symptom validation like feeling like their symptoms, a lot of patients left feeling like their symptoms were not serious enough to warrant an ED visit. Or some, some patients even said they felt stupid that they even went to the ED after speaking to the provider. Or they felt like the general care and compassion just wasn't there. As I mentioned before, there was also uh, talks about like emphasis on quality of time. So not so much quantity, but quality and how some patients felt like providers did not spend enough time with them or maybe the provider was in the room with them, but they felt like they didn't have the provider's full attention. Some patients will even mention about hands-on experience. Like they felt like the providers would not lay hands on them. Like they would just ask them questions, order scans, order blood work, but wouldn't even touch them or the particular area that they were complaining about. And then also addressing their logistical concerns. Like some patients come in thinking that they're gonna have a specific test done, like specific blood work drawn, or maybe CAT scans that we may not think or is actually warranted based on our exam. But just communicating to the patient about what their expectations are and why you've come to the differential diagnosis that you come down to and basically why you decide on the plan that you decide to follow through on. And also leave room for shared decision-making as well for the patients. Uh, that has been also associated with um, improvement in um, patient satisfaction. So when I think about this, I think about my experiences in the past couple of years, more specifically, even during the fourth year. And when I see patients that come in with something as simple as a non-accidental trauma, which may not require as much, um, depending on the particular trauma, but the psychological support that you can provide to this patient and their family could mean everything. So in the case of this two-year-old child who came in after a mother left her home with a family friend and found that the patient came in with multiple scars, including this particular one on the arm and also the legs. And the family member was told, told the, the mother that basically the child was at the park, fell. Um, but on further examination, you can see there was like a little bit more, this is not the actual picture, but it was a little bit more within that is there was different discoloration at the borders. Um, there was a question of whether or not this was actually like a, a curling iron was used to burn the, the patient. The mother wasn't allowed to stress since there was previous e um, ACS cases open on the patient due to abuse from the father. And this was a family member friend of the father's. 
at this time, you know, when it comes to burns and things like that, we can think about how much, how much degree of burn did the patient have? Um, what parts of the body was affected? We can think about wound management. Does the patient need fluids? Do they need to be transferred? But don't forget about the patient and what the, the family member is going through as well. And don't forget to address that. When it comes to like psychological trauma, like I mentioned before, when I had a particular patient who was like eight years old who came in um, on the day of her birthday after her father basically um, shot not only her mother, but all of her siblings. You know, the complaint, the chief complaint that was basically written in triage was tinnitus from the gunshots. But with this particular patient, there was not much I could do in regards to that. But she also had a headache because she was also hungry because she was basically getting ready to go to her birthday dinner with her family before her father came in and did that. Um, so just sitting down with the patient and connecting with her and just being there and being a form of support for her, you know, using something as simple as spikes, it actually became relevant in this case because I had to deliver the bad news that actually her whole entire family was gone. Her mother is dead, her sisters were gone, and her father had eventually killed himself. Um, and committed suicide a few blocks down. Um, and I remember with this particular interaction, I remember this case, she didn't want to go home. We eventually got her grandmother to come in to take her home. And she was like, I don't want to go with my grandma. She's like, can I come home with you? And these like kind of, kind of connections, what brought me the most joy throughout my fourth year was when I had to deal with these kind of patients and know that the impact that I had on them would actually make a difference. And then you have the patient, the pedestrian struck. And this is not actually the victim, but this is the person who actually hit the patient. He came in, he had blood all over his face. He was about 18 years old. Um, he had multiple corneal abrasions and blurry vision as well from that and severe pain in his eyes. But that wasn't what he was concerned about. He was concerned about the patient or the person who he just hit. He was concerned whether or not this patient was alive. He just remembers the lifeless body on the street in front of him before the cops came and took him away and come and bring him to the ED. So with this particular patient, it was something that simple corneal abrasion. We, we examined the patient, we grabbed the woods lamp, we, we applied the touch of pain, um, we value the eyes. Uh, it could be very simple, but in regards to this particular patient, I had to deal with the fear that he was feeling, the guilt he was feeling from what happened, the confusion he had in regards to the details of what actually happened and concerns about whether or not he was gonna to go to jail at the same time. He had to deal with all this all at the same time while also he kept asking about the patient who actually ended up dying in CCT. So there was like communicating with the patient, trying to keep him calm and telling him that we're focused on his, on his care, but at the same time respecting the other patient's confidentiality and not being able to communicate that the patient actually died. Then you have the patient that was being trafficked. A young girl who's 14 years old. She came in basically with head trauma. She had um, multiple, like she had periorbital swelling, ecchymosis. She had litigation marks around her neck. Um, she was basically strangled by um, fellow trafficked, I guess, individuals as well. Um, she was basically, she came in and basically EMS was stating that she was involved with an older gentleman in, the 20, in his 20s. And she was in the apartment when two other women who also resided in the apartment came and attacked her. It wasn't really clear in regards to what exactly her relationship was, her relationship was with this individual she was staying with. But later on, we found out that she was introduced to him by, by a drug dealer on the street. And she had been jumping from hotel to hotel providing services for different men, just for food to eat and a place to stay. We ended up working with law enforcement to find out that they actually knew who the individual was who's trafficking her. The patient refused to press charges um, and eventually was discharged back to her group home where, she was, where we've been told that she's escaped multiple times. My, with my few interactions with her during that day, I had to remind her of what was going on and probably some of the emotions that she might be feeling. Um, and seeing that a lot of people in her, in this particular situation that she was in, may feel frightened, may not know the repercussions of leaving this individual. 
but at the same time, knowing that it wasn't her fault and that she deserved a better life than what she was accustomed to. So just thinking about empathy altogether, empathy can impact the future of healthcare. When you look at these patients and you think about why the safety net for this community is needed and why someone is overutilized instead of primary care services, you have to think about some of these children who enter our PDD who may have experienced uncompassionate care or re-traumatized um, or failed or certain needs that they had weren't really addressed and how they'll grow up to experience stress and anxiety when, when dealing with the healthcare system and how they may later become adults who fear the healthcare system or have distrust with medical providers or avoid the healthcare system altogether or who may become later on non-compliant and have poor outcomes. When you think about empathy, um, it means to basically put yourself in the other person's shoes and learn their point of view. So you have to ask yourself, how would I feel if I were in their situation? Listening with empathy means you listen without interruption and you listen for fears and feelings. You listen for what the other person is, is, is saying and what they aren't, what they're actually not saying at all. And you're not trying to fix the situation like we're always trying to do or we're accustomed to doing. Sometimes the healing comes with just listening. So thank you for just taking the time to listen to my lecture. Um, and I hope you got something out of it. Um, these are just some of my references. And then I just wanna say thank you to my class. You guys have been absolutely amazing. Um, you know, what I decided to come, or when I, Kings County Downstate was my number one choice. And I'll say it, I'll choose it over and over again if I had to. Um, and you guys played a large role in that. And thank you for accepting me just the way that I am. And then for everyone else in the other classes, the interns, the PGY twos and threes, and even the alums, um, again, same thing. Um, I'm so happy to be part of um, this family all together. And then of course, I couldn't, I have to thank every single person <laughs> and for every single attendee that I've ever worked with. Um, but more specifically, I wanna thank Dr. Khan um, who encouraged me and helped me with this presentation and also Drs. Willis, Kendall, Camacho, Sanusi and every attendee that's helped me to find the confidence I needed while also, also challenged me to be better, not only for, for myself, but for my patients. And of course, I wanna thank my family. Um, I wouldn't be here without them. They've been here with me every step of the way. Uh, and they've been one of the key motivations I've had to enter medicine and to choose EM. And if I had to, I would choose it all over again. Thank you.